Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Or Does It Explode? Lorraine Hansberry. It was in May of 1961 that Franz Fanon first published a portion of what would become The Wretched of the Earth in the journal Le Temps Moderne, or Modern Times, a French intellectual outlet founded by Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The piece published was On Violence, which would of course later become the first and most famous chapter of Wretched. According to Robert Nemiroff, May of 1961 is also when the African-American playwright Lorraine Hansberry figured out the plot of her play, Les Blancs, a play that revolves around the very theme for which Fanon's book is so well known, anti-colonial violence in Africa. Now, Robert Nemiroff was a very particular kind of expert on Hansberry's work. He was, for many years, Hansberry's husband, and given that Les Blancs remained unfinished at the time of Hansberry's death, The version that eventually played on Broadway in 1970, starring James Earl Jones in the lead role, was completed by Nemiroff himself. So if the remarkable coincidence of May 1961 was no coincidence at all, and Fanon's article directly inspired Hansberry's play, Nemiroff would almost certainly have known this and acknowledged the inspiration. Instead, he tells us that Hansberry first had the ideas that evolved into Le Blanc in the late spring or summer of 1960. But this doesn't rule out a francophone background for this work of an American playwright. The very title might even lead audiences to expect that it is set in francophone Africa. But the fictional land depicted in the play is, by all appearances, a British colony, patterned in many respects after Kenya. The title, Les Blancs, meaning the whites, was chosen as a way of responding to the French writer Jean Genet's play, Les Nègres, or The Blacks which premiered in Paris in 1959 and ran in New York City in 1961, with none other than James Earl Jones in the lead role. Nemiroff lets us know that attending this production is what inspired Hansberry to get to work on her play. While this helps to confirm that Fanon was not a factor in Hansberry's writing process, the connection to Genet begins to show that she was responding to the intellectual life of Paris and the French-speaking world more generally. This is something Hansberry herself made explicit, writing in the New York Times in 1964. The last play of hers to be produced during her lifetime was The Sign in Sidney Brustein's Window, which is about a New York intellectual, the Sidney Brustein of the title. Explaining how she came to write it, Hansberry said, Few things are more natural than that the tortures of the engagé should attract me thematically. Being 34 years old at this writing means that I am of the generation which grew up in the swirl and dash of the South Camus debate of the post-war years. Hansberry is referring here to the very public end to the friendship between Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, both towering artists and intellectuals in France during the 1940s and 50s. Part of the reason for their falling out was their differing views of communism, which Hansberry evokes by speaking of how some of her own closest friends resembled the two French thinkers as they crossed each other, leaping in and out of the Communist Party. More fundamental, and at the root of their disagreement about communism, were the different stances of Sartre and Camus on the use of violence for political ends. This central contradiction led to conflict over the Algerian Revolution. Camus, a white Algerian, did not support independence for Algeria, and decried the violent acts of the FLN, whereas Sartre enthusiastically supported their cause. This is, of course, why Sartre wrote the preface to Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, in which he supported Fanon's claims about the necessity of violence. In May of 1961, then, both Fanon and Hansberry were thinking about anti-colonial violence in Africa, and doing so within a larger intellectual context that included Sartre's break with Camus. The similarities did not end there. Both died in their mid-thirties, Fanon of leukemia and Hansberry of pancreatic cancer, having achieved prodigious accomplishments in the short time given to them. The timing of their deaths, Fanon in 1960 and Hansberry in 1965, prevented them from seeing the further course of struggles for freedom in Africa, America, and elsewhere during the latter part of the 1960s. We, on the other hand, can look back and see just how impossible it is to separate the worlds in which Fanon and Hansberry lived and thought. The Franco-Caribbean Fanon 
would turn out to be a major influence on the Black Power movement in the United States. This movement, which arguably disrupted and displaced the civil rights movement as the 1960s drew to an end, will provide the political and cultural context for the thinkers and schools of thought we will discuss in episodes to come. The Black Power movement is most naturally dated as beginning in 1966, as that was the year that Black Power became a popular protest slogan. This means that Hansberry, who died in 1965, did not get to see and evaluate the shift in political orientation associated with the slogan, unlike one of her closest friends, James Baldwin, who did live through the Black Power era, dying much later in 1987. Part of the tragedy of Hansberry being taken so soon is that her relevance to the philosophical themes associated with Black Power, themes like the question of the necessity of violence, is often overlooked. She died, to be more specific, in January 1965, a month before the assassination of Malcolm X. Like Fanon, X is well recognized as a clear intellectual influence on the Black Power movement. We can only speculate as to whether Hansberry would have been seen as similarly influential if she had managed to finish Les Blancs before her death. Not that Hansberry is forgotten. She is among the most famous African-American writers of the 20th century because of her first play, A Raisin in the Sun. It was the first play by a black woman playwright to be produced on Broadway. For once, James Earl Jones was not the star, but rather Sidney Poitier. The production was a grand success, winning recognition as best play of the year from the New York Drama Critics Circle. From today's perspective, one can plausibly name it as the most popular play by and about African Americans. So A Raisin in the Sun is plenty famous, and Hansberry too, as a result. But is it, and is she, properly understood? The play is sometimes seen as representing an integrationist ethic associated with the civil rights movement. When this interpretation is combined with ignorance of her other work, it becomes impossible to see Hansberry as relevant to the Black Power movement in the way that Fanon and X were. In fact, she should be seen as important, not only in relation to Black Power, but for a number of other social movements that gained in prominence after death, such as the feminist and gay liberation movements. Hansberry was born in 1930 in Chicago. Her parents were both college-educated, and their family was certainly economically privileged in relation to the community surrounding them during this difficult era of the Great Depression. Carl Augustus Hansberry, her father, was a real estate developer who made money from dividing properties into small apartments, into which African Americans migrating from the South to Chicago were squeezed in significant numbers. He also founded Lake Street Bank, among the earliest Black-owned financial institutions in the city. Lorraine's mother, Nanny Perry Hansberry, was a teacher who was also involved in local politics. The couple bring to mind Du Bois' ideal of the talented tenth. Carl and Nanny were educated members of the black middle class and also activists who fought the oppressive practice of racially restrictive covenants. In 1940, the United States Supreme Court heard the case Hansberry v. Lee, which resulted from the Hansberrys purchasing a home that was covered by a covenant intended to keep the neighborhood white. Overturning the decisions of the lower courts, the Supreme Court found in the Hansberry's favor, affirming their right to keep the home. Lorraine was a child at this time and would always remember the terror of the hostile white mob gathered outside of the house as the family fought to keep it. It is quite obvious that this experience informed her work, as A Raisin in the Sun is, in part, the story of a black family that has to decide whether to move into a house in a hostile white neighborhood in Chicago. Mention must also be made of her uncle, William Leo Hansberry, a Harvard-trained historian. Although he was in Washington, D.C., teaching at Howard University, rather than living in Chicago, where Lorraine grew up, it cannot be doubted that his example of Black intellectual life had some impact on his niece. In fact, Uncle Leo is considered by many to be something of a father to African studies as a discipline. Directly influenced by Du Bois, he strongly promoted the interdisciplinary study of Africa and its history at Howard. This had an impact on both African-American students and African students, like Anande Azikiwe, who was mentored by Leo Hansberry just as he was by Alain Locke. Lorraine shared Uncle Leo's abiding interest in Africa, as is evident even before Le Blanc, in A Raisin in the Sun. Her most famous play features the character Joseph Azagai, a Nigerian student who confronts questions of decolonization in his dialogue with the character of Benitha, the African-American woman he loves. After graduating from Chicago's Englewood High School in 1948, 
Hansberry did not go to study with Uncle Leo at Howard, but instead to the University of Wisconsin. She left after two years to go to New York, where, after another failed attempt to study at the New School, she found her vocation as a writer. She contributed to the newspaper Freedom, a joint venture by none other than Paul Robeson and Du Bois. As a writer and editor at Freedom, Hansberry became a mentee of these famous figures. She even took a course on African history taught by Du Bois himself at the Jefferson School of Social Science, an adult education center affiliated with the Communist Party. In 1951, she went to Washington, D.C. to report for Freedom on the Sojourners for Truth and Justice. This is the activist group we first mentioned in episode 92, which was organized by Claudia Jones, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Louise Thompson Patterson, and other Black women intellectuals on the left. The early 1950s also brought Robert Nemiroff, a white Jewish activist and graduate student, into Hansberry's life. They were married in 1953, and it is telling of who they were that the day before the wedding, they went together to protest the execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who had been convicted of spying on behalf of the Soviet Union. Their relationship was unconventional, as Hansberry came to recognize herself as a lesbian. She joined the Daughters of Bilitis, the first lesbian civil rights organization, and wrote letters and stories published in its magazine, The Ladder. She signed these using initials or pseudonyms, keeping her participation in the organization quiet, as did many members in this time when few were openly gay. A letter of hers, published in the August 1957 issue, is particularly noteworthy. It is often cited for the part where she identifies herself among the category of heterosexually married lesbians. Her discussion of what it is like to be one of those is certainly fascinating. The most intriguing bit of the letter, however, comes at the end. Hansberry calls for women intellectuals to begin taking on some of the ethical questions which a male-dominated culture has produced. She is concerned not just about obvious forms of male dominance, but rather common modes of thinking and acting that may have their roots in patriarchal structures. She writes, Without revised basic thinking, the woman intellectual is likely to find herself trying to draw conclusions, moral conclusions, based on acceptance of a social moral superstructure which has never admitted to the equality of women and is therefore immoral itself, as per marriage, as per sexual practices, as per the rearing of children, etc. Hansberry then tentatively raises the question of whether oppression on the basis of sexual orientation may ultimately be grounded in the oppression of women, writing, There may be women to emerge who will be able to formulate a new and possible concept that homosexual persecution and condemnation has at its roots not only social ignorance, but a philosophically active anti-feminist dogma. But that is but a kernel of a speculative embryonic idea improperly introduced here. Hansberry was able to cultivate some romantic relationships with women. Still, while she ceased to have a romantic relationship with Nemiroff and chose to divorce him in 1964, he remained the closest person to Hansberry until the end of her life. Back in the 1950s, he helped make it possible for her to focus on writing after a song that he co-wrote became popular and began to bring in royalties. Hansberry, who stopped working for freedom in 1953, struggled with restlessness and depression for much of this decade. In spite of this, the ideas for A Raisin in the Sun came together. The play was completed in 1957, though it took until 1959 for producer Philip Rose to get it to the Broadway stage. Once it arrived, it was a raging success. Not only did it powerfully bring black characters to the stage, it also brought black people to the theater, according to James Baldwin. He wrote, I had never in my life seen so many black people in the theater. And the reason was that never before in the entire history of the American theater had so much of the truth of black people's lives been seen on the stage. A Raisin in the Sun depicts the Youngers, a black family living on Chicago's South Side. The central question of the play is what will be done with the life insurance money coming to Mama Younger after the death of her husband. Walter Lee Younger, her adult son, wants to leave his job as a chauffeur to open a liquor store, which his mother finds morally unacceptable. He feels unsupported by the women in his life, namely Mama and his wife Ruth. Walter and Ruth have a son, Travis, making three generations in the home. The remaining Younger is Benita, who is in college and plans to become a doctor. It's hard not to draw comparisons between the aspiring intellectual Benita and Hansberry herself. Certainly, Benita's fascination for Africa, connected to her relationship with Joseph Azagai, reflects Hansberry's abiding interest. 
Mama chooses to use some of the money to purchase a nice home they can live in, and it so happens that this home is in a white neighborhood. Walter, who ends up losing the portion of the money that Mama gave him to a scammer, comes close to accepting the offer of some white neighbors to buy the home so that the youngers will not move in. He reverses course, however, and the play ends with the family packing to move into the home Mama bought. This final choice to move to a white neighborhood is what has led some to see the play as upholding a simplistic, integrationist approach to black progress. Norman Algren, a white critic, attacked the play from a leftist perspective, claiming, it is not a play about human dignity, but how to invest wisely. Amiri Baraka, a central figure of the black arts movement of the late 1960s, was likewise critical of the play. Looking back decades later, he explained, we thought that Hansberry's play was middle class, in that its focus seemed to be on moving into white folks' neighborhoods when most blacks were just trying to pay their rent in ghetto shacks. But by 1987, when he wrote this, Baraka had changed his position, admitting, we missed the essence of the work, that Hansberry had created a family engaged in the same class struggle and ideological struggle as existed in the movement itself and among the people. Julian Lester, another important writer in his own right, has argued that the play dramatizes a clash in values, namely the opposition between Walter's claim that life is about money and Mama's claim that life is about freedom, with Hansberry's ultimate message being that we must seek to relate to material things in ways that affirm Mama's claim. Lesser takes dismissive critics to have missed this by wrongfully thinking of the theme of home ownership as a matter of upward mobility and conspicuous consumption. What they are missing, Lester claims, is that it is a general characteristic of black families suffering the inequality of ghetto conditions that they wish to get the hell out of there as quickly as they can. From that point of view, the whiteness of the neighborhood where an affordable home can be purchased is to some extent beside the point. Hansberry is not endorsing the pursuit of integration in the sense of encouraging black people to desire to be around white people. She is endorsing the refusal to submit to the indignity of racially oppressive restrictions on freedoms, including, but not limited to, freedom in buying a home. To gain some perspective on how A Raisin in the Sun and Les Blancs can be understood as parts of a broader vision, it is helpful to consider a letter by Hansberry to the New York Times from 1964. It ends by quoting Langston Hughes's poem, Harlem, which is among the best known of his works, in no small part because a line from the poem was chosen as the title of a famous play. Yes, we are talking about A Raisin in the Sun, which means Hansberry would expect readers of this letter, written long after the success of that play, to know that she is invoking that previous work of hers. We might as well not let Hansberry have all the quoting fun, so here is Harlem in its entirety. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? When considering the title of Hansberry's play, we can think of Hughes as having posed various possible scenarios that may result from the deferral of dreams. From among them, these Hansberry selected the image of a dream drying up like a raisin in the sun. Reading the poem as a whole, though, one is apt to be struck most by the haunting, even menacing final line, or does it explode? This aspect of the poem is certainly what is most relevant to the content of the letter, which concerns the question of how best to push for civil rights. In case anyone wrongly takes the choice of the younger family at the end of the play to indicate that Lorraine romanticized the Hansberry family's fight of her childhood, she makes it clear in this letter how traumatic it was. She explains how she was spat upon, cursed, and beaten on the way to school, and how someone from the mob outside the house threw something that could have killed her. She writes also of the impact of the experience on her father. She is sure that the cost and emotional turmoil, time and money, led to his early death. All of this informs her open-mindedness concerning new and radical tactics in civil rights protest, with a proposed disruption of the World's Fair through blocking traffic being the particular inspiration for the letter. Here is how she puts it. That is the reality that I am faced with when I now read that some Negroes my own age and younger say that we must now lie down in the streets, tie up traffic, do whatever we can, take to the hills with guns if necessary, and fight back. Her explicit reference to political violence and the imagery of taking to the hills reminds one that she had been working on Les Blancs for years at the time that she wrote this letter. If we wish to see Les Blancs as in some sense a sequel to A Raisin in the Sun, 
it might help to treat Or Does It Explode as an alternative title for the play left unfinished at the time of her death. Le Blanc takes place in Zatembe, a fictional country, although, as we mentioned, Hensbury was inspired especially by the anti-colonial struggle in Kenya. She even drew on Jomo Kenyatta's book Facing Mount Kenya for a folktale that is important to the plot, and an unseen character in the play, Amos Kumalo, is similar in a number of ways to Kenyatta himself. The play's central character is Chembe Matose, who lives in England with a white wife and one son. He has returned to Zatembe because of the death of his father, but violent struggle is underway and Chembe will not be able to hesitate forever without being involved. The play's events lead towards a bloody and fiery climax, which includes Chembe killing his brother Abiose, who informed authorities about a resistance fighter and thus got that fighter killed. Right before the curtain closes, Chembe sinks to the ground beside the body of his brother and emits an animal-like cry of grief. In our episodes on Fanon, we had a lot to say about his stance on violence, and the same issue arises here. It seems wrong to treat Hansberry as glorifying violence, given the utter anguish of that final moment. Yet, it is plausible to treat the play as defending the necessity of violence. It is significant that Madame Nielsen, an old white missionary who taught Chembe and Apiose when they were young, voices her own support for violent struggle in the play's penultimate scene, even though this very struggle killed her husband, Reverend Nielsen. Another important character in the play is Charlie Morris, a white American journalist who has some fascinating exchanges with Jembe. One of the topics of their heated discourse is the reality and significance of race. In one scene, Charlie suggests that Jembe hates all white men. Jembe responds that he wishes it were so, for it would make everything infinitely easier. It is not so, however, and Chembe explains that this is because he has seen the slums of Liverpool and Dublin, Anne Frank's attic in Amsterdam, and other reminders that, rather than a simple common enemy, white people are a complex group, within which some oppress others, just as they oppress the non-white people outside the group. In a later scene, Charlie is pleased to hear Chembe call racism an invention to justify the rule of some men over others. Charlie thinks that Chembe is agreeing with him that race is ultimately irrelevant to their discussion. Chembe is careful to correct this, clarifying that a device is a device, but that it also has consequences. Once invented, it takes on a life, a reality of its own. To be shot for being black in Mississippi, or Zatembe, is to suffer the reality of the device, and according to Chembe, it is pointless to pretend that it doesn't exist merely because it is a lie. This is a remarkable expression of the social constructionist position in the philosophy of race. As we can see from this example, the fact that A Raisin in the Sun and Le Blanc are plays does not stop them from expressing philosophical ideas. That being said, Hansberry's discursive prose is too little known and undervalued. We've already drawn on pieces from The Ladder and The New York Times, but there are at least two other more substantial prose works that deserve mention. The first of them, an essay entitled the Negro Writer and His Roots, was delivered at a Black Writers' Conference about two weeks before A Raisin in the Sun opened on Broadway. Without naming Du Bois and Hughes, the essay bears their strong influence. Hansberry frames her remarks as being about the inseparability of truth and beauty, and therefore of truth and art. This calls to mind Du Bois's insistence on the inseparability of truth, beauty, and goodness in his Criteria of Negro Art. Hansberry follows him by arguing that, in light of this principle, artists should be self-consciously politically engaged. She does this innovatively, though, by discussing four illusions in American culture that she believes African-American writers need to unmask. They are, first, that good art is not socially engaged art, second, that people can be understood separately from the world around them, third, that the United States is just one big middle class, and fourth, that it is fine for the United States to take its time rectifying its injustices and inequalities. Notwithstanding her focus here on the situation in the U.S., she contrasts the final illusion with the truth that a deluded and misguided worldwide minority is rapidly losing ground in the area of debating time alone. Hansberry optimistically sees growing solidarity among non-white people in response to this situation. She pays tribute to one form of that solidarity, pan-Africanism, by stating with firm belief that the ultimate destiny and aspirations of the African people and 20 million American Negroes are inextricably and magnificently bound up together forever. 
Like Hughes in his essay, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, Hensbury also insists on the need for African-American writers to turn inward and value their complex cultural heritage in order to create great art. In this context, she refers explicitly to Alain Locke, citing his view that African-American culture has not been properly understood. Then, later on in the essay, she explicitly aligns herself with E. Franklin Frazier's attack on the narrow-minded complacency of the black middle class. She even cites her friend James Baldwin at one point, specifically his view that the United States is perhaps the loneliest country in the world. Hansbury thus carried on a conversation about the nature of black art that gained unprecedented prominence in the decade just before her birth, during the Harlem Renaissance, and which would reach a fever pitch again in the late 1960s, right after her death. It is tempting to think of her as a sort of bridge between these times. The other prose piece worth highlighting brings us back to the matter of her connection to French intellectual life. This is her unfinished review of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, the piece through which Hansberry is represented in Beverly Guy Sheftal's classic collection of black feminist thought, Words of Fire. During difficult times, Hansberry apparently found respite in Beauvoir's book. We are told by her biographer, Imani Perry, that she treated the text like a girlfriend. In her review, Hansberry does not hide her appreciation for the book, suggesting that it may very well prove to be the most important work of this century. A significant portion of her review engages not with Beauvoir's claims, but rather with the question of why Beauvoir was so widely ignored on the American scene. There is, however, also criticism, particularly on the matter of feminine attire. Hansbury interprets Beauvoir as insufficiently protective of women's freedom to dress however they want, including in very feminine ways. While making this argument, Hansbury expresses a dim view of men's fashion. This writer, for instance, finds the drab, colorless garb of men as distasteful as any other outrage of arbitrary fashion, and is inclined to feel that the decorative traditions of women's wear, whatever their origins, lend a desirable and attractive quality to life, to existence. Clearly, Hansberry could weigh in provocatively on subjects of all sorts. As none other than Martin Luther King Jr. said after her death, her creative ability and her profound grasp of the deep social issues confronting the world today will remain an inspiration to generations yet unborn. One can only agree with King. Hansberry's writings were seminal in the most literal of senses. They were not like a raisin drying in the sun, but like seeds from which new shoots could grow. We think it wouldn't be raisin your expectations too highly to say that we'll be tending to those new shoots in upcoming episodes of The History of Africana Philosophy. <laughs> Thank you.